Okay, so here is an argument in predicate logic, and we'd like to do a proof for this, uh, but it's really not the predicate part that I'm going to focus on. This proof involves proven antecedent, and so I'm going to pretty much run right through all of this until we get to the proven antecedent, and then I'll slow down. Okay, so first step of the method is always to look at the, quanti at the conclusion and see if it's quantified. Our conclusion is definitely quantified, and so what we want to do is make a box and assume the opposite for dash in or dash out. So make a good sized box here, about like that. And now we need to write up at the top of this box what we're doing here. This will be line three. It is a provisional assumption for dash out. It's a PA, it doesn't look like it. And to assume the opposite of this is very easy. All you have to do is put a dash in front of it. So we get dash for all x, h, x. Okay. Step two is double negation, but we don't have any double negations to do. And so uh, we're on to the heart of the method, and that's to use the order, the rules in the right order. What's the order? It begins with QE, and then EO, and then UO. What do they stand for? Quantifier exchange, existential out, universal out. Remember, the predicate logic proof method is quite easy, usually. All right, so quantifier exchange. We have a single dash in front of a quantifier on line three. We should change it into, there is an x dash hx. Move the dash to the inside, change the quantifier. That's 3qe. All right, and let's check off line three. We're up to existential out. Yes, we do have one existential out to work on. So line five here is going to be to drop the quantifier, rewrite the rest of the formula, and replace the variable with a name. What name should we choose? Well, it's got to be a new name. But there are no names in here, so we can go ahead and use A as a very reasonable choice. So that would be 4EO. All right. Uh, check off line four. We're up to universal out. We have two of them to work on, lines one and two, and so I'm going to work on line one first. Uh, I've got to try to write small to actually get this in here. So PA arrow, and we've got RA wedge SA. Why am I choosing A? I can choose whatever name I want since it's universal out. In practice, you want to choose any old names that are already in the proof if you want to get the proof done. And so that would be 1UO. Check it off. And now we work on line 2. And very same thing, we're just going to get SA. So that's 2UO. All right, at this point, we've got all the predicate, all the lines that have quantifiers in them are checked off. So it's like we're starting a new proof. 5, 6, and 7 are our premises, and our conclusion is what? I should have a contradiction symbol down here at the bottom of this box. Okay, so we're back to the old rules. Now, as we look at line 5 and 6 and 7, trying to do something, notice lines 5 and 7 are really uninteresting. They don't, they don't have any true connectives, and so there's nothing to think about. Line 6 is where the action is. What's the main connective of line 6? It's obviously this arrow. When the arrow is the main connective, which two rules are you supposed to think about? Arrow in and modus tollens. Arrow in. Arrow out and modus tollens. What am I saying? Arrow out and modus tollens. Can we do either one of these things on line 6? To do arrow out, what would we need to have? PA arrow RA wedge SA. Well, we don't have it on another line right now. Can we build it? Well, the answer is yes and no. We're about to do proven antecedent. And the reason that we're going to do proven antecedent is, in fact, to build exactly this. But if you're thinking top down, what you really should say as you're looking at this line is, no, I can't build that right now. I can't build it in a standard top down way. Now, you might be saying, well, wait, RA wedge SA, I could build that, right? Because notice I have SA on line 7, so I could build RA wedge SA. But the fact is, that's not really going to do you any good. If you just put that on line 8, 
because the main connective of this right here is an arrow. So really, at this point, you should be looking at line 6 and saying, okay, I cannot build PA, arrow, RA, wedge, SA to do the arrow out. What about the modus tollens? To do modus tollens, what would I need to have? The negation of the consequent, which in fact would be dash HA ampersand GA. Can I build that? Well, in fact, building that would be pretty difficult also. If you're very creative, there is a sneaky way to do it using the reverse De Morgan's, but I don't even really want to talk about that. So I'd like to say, no, that's not something that we can build right now. In short, what I want to say is that we're stuck up at the top of the proof right now. What do we do when we're stuck at the top? We go to the bottom. But when we go to the bottom, we see a contradiction symbol. And that's when we say to ourselves, OK, now it must be time to think about proven antecedent. What's the indication that you should definitely use proven antecedent? It's when you find that you've got a line of this form, P arrow Q arrow R. Do we have such a line? Well, in fact, of course, it's right there on line 6. There's P. That whole thing there is Q. And that's R. P arrow Q arrow R. Arrow is the main connective. And then an arrow as the main connective of the antecedent as well. So we have a P arrow Q arrow R. What proven antecedent is all about is proving this antecedent thing. We said if we had the an that antecedent, then we could do the arrow out. What, I'm what I'd love to be able to do is sort of demystify the proven antecedent strategy. It basically says, OK, we're in, the, we're in a position of last resort. We know we want to work on this arrow. To do that, let's just pencil in what we know that we'd like to have, namely, P A arrow R A wedge S A. Pencil it in, basically right in the middle of the available space, and then you go back and try to prove it. Now, how would I prove this? Well, its main connective is an arrow, right? So I'm going to start by making a box. This will be a box for arrow in. It's going to have P A at the top, and it's going to have R A wedge S A at the bottom if I can prove it. So that's line eight. Provisional assumption for arrow in. And now I just have to see how I get RA wedge SA. Now it actually does make sense to do the wedge in. And so here I say, okay, well, this is easy. I just do seven wedge in. And then I will have finished the box that proves PA arrow RA wedge SA. Eight through nine, arrow in. And now I've finished proven antecedent. The whole point of proven antecedent is you're stuck at the top and you're not seeing anything obvious to do. Then you look at the bottom and you see the contradiction symbol and you go look for a P arrow Q arrow R. If you find it, you say, well, gosh, in order to do the arrow out, in order to set up the arrow out, I'm going to take that antecedent, pencil it in, and prove it. Of course, now we do have P A arrow R A wedge S A. So what do we get to do? We get to write HA ampersand GA and the justification 6, 10 and the rule arrow out. Easy. Well, of course, now that's an ampersand, so let's break it up. Truth is, all I need is the HA and I'm running out of space, so I'm going to put HA 11 ampersand out. And then I have my contradiction. It would be HA ampersand dash HA from 5 and 12 ampersand in, 5 comma 12 ampersand in, and I am done. 14 will be 3 through 13, and the rule dash out. All right, I, well, I guess what I really want to emphasize is that proven antecedent is not that complicated. It's all about taking an arrow statement and proving the antecedent so that you set up the arrow out. All right, good luck.